Book of Gathcast. I'm Dr. Sanders. And I'm just Brian. And today, we have a heavily requested episode. This episode is so heavily requested that I managed to find a request dating back to the faraway year of 2016. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> this actually is a really heavily requested band. I understand why people want us to take a look at this particular group. It's because of its relation to a lot of different things. And the group is Shadow Project. Yeah, you know, the lead singer of Shadow Project kind of sounds a little bit like the dude from Christian Death. That's right. And th- there's a reason for that. It's actually because of Roz Williams is, well, he's one of the singers in the band. And so in some ways he's the main singer but as the albums went on, he kind of became more of like, it kind of became more of a duet sort of band. We'll get to that. Yeah. And of course, you can catch Gothcast on Spotify, on iTunes. It is brought to you in part by the Bell Free Network, bringing lots of great different podcasts and lots of different content relating to the Goth subculture. And uh, of course, if you're interested in anything Gothcast, you can go to gothcast.com to see everything. Gothcast comes out every two weeks on Wednesday. But just in case you're not aware of the the history with Shadow Project, let me just go over it a little bit. And I did cover this inside of the previous three Christian Death episodes. If you haven't listened to those yet, shame on you. I actually do really like those episodes still. Yeah, no, they're good. I, I, Christian Death was a death rock band, super influential, great band. Uh, initially formed with Roz Williams singing and we had like Rick Agnew and we had some help from Eva O actually on Only Theater Pain. And with Roger Williams, Christian Death did a number of albums. And this is all the way up to 1985. So you had Only Theater of Pain, Catastrophe Ballet, and Ashes. And this was all with Roz Williams singing. There were some dramatic member changes. Like with the first album, you have basically a completely different band. And then with Catastrophe Ballet and Ashes, you have a, a new lineup. And when Roz left that band, Christian Death with Valor Canned, he was the guitarist at the time when Roz was singing. He went on to just adopt the name, keep the name going, and just kept releasing albums. So most people see it as two different eras of the band where Roz was, you know, like this is the original with Roz Williams, and then Valor Canned's Christian Death is kind of like the secondary. Most people have some uh, strong feelings about the decision to continue with Valor Can, like his you know, keep to keep going. And to this day, Valor Canned Christian Death is still releasing albums. Uh, in fact, I think they even just announced some new music or something recently. But their most recent album came out in 2015. So that's, you know, and they, they tour and do all stuff. So later, and this is where it gets complicated, <laughs> in the 90s, Roz Williams formed his own version of Christian Death again, separate from all the original, like the members that were still touring So in the 90s, you had two versions of Christian Death, separate bands, separate members, each releasing albums, sometimes in the same year. So like the Rage of Angels and I think it's Sexy Death God both came out in the same year. One Christian Death with Valor Can singing, totally different band called Christian Death featuring Roz Williams releasing their own albums. Now, while the Roz Williams, like... Christian Death featuring Roz Williams in the 90s was going. He had another project going, Roz Williams, called Shadow Project. And in fact, they had albums releasing the same year as some of those Christian Death releases. So it's a little complicated. Basically that Roz Williams was in the band, left. The band kept going without him. He eventually tried to use the name again later but said featuring Roz Williams, so Christian Death featuring Roz Williams, and released a number of albums that way. And during that time, he also did this band called Shadow Project. And Shadow Project did technically start before, you know, the albums were released. Like the first album we have is released in 1991. The band technically started or is listed as starting inside of 1987. But, and, and there is a demo from that time that you can listen to. But the band itself really didn't get going until later than that. So hopefully that makes sense. But you do have the inclusion of some really important people here, the most notable of which is going to be Eva O. 
And today she's known for making some very interesting music, in my opinion. It's very, um, yeah, well, you know it when you hear it. Uh, yeah. And at the time, they were married. Eva O and Roz Williams were married. So from 19, I think it was 1988 to I think 93, they were married. And there's been a whole bunch of debate about Roz Williams' sexuality and sexuality. Why did I say it like that? Sexuality? I didn't, been, I didn't hear that one. I didn't hear it? Really? Yeah. In my head, I heard it. We'll, we'll play it back later on and make, okay. make fun of you. Okay. But yeah, there was a whole bunch of debate and questions about Roz Williams' sexuality and all this stuff about him and Eva O. Like, what was the marriage? What did it represent? Like, uh, it, that's the whole thing, which I'm not even going to discuss here because it's not really important to this music. I don't, at least to, to these particular albums, I don't know if that necessarily is uh, the point of these. Uh, I'm sure that we could have a whole podcast you know, going into Roz Williams theories and different stuff about each album. But these were really the two main people you got to think of for this group. It's Roz Williams and Eva O. And we have some really like hardcore death rock sound. And uh, it seems like it picked up from a lot of different things, but you're actually going to have some songs from super heroines in here, which was Eva O's band. You're actually going to have literally like covers of those songs on these albums. It's really interesting. And then if you're wondering where the name came from, Shadow Project, it's because when the Hiroshima bombs were dropped, the nuclear bombs, when the people were basically disintegrated, it left the shadow of the person, like it looks like a shadow. Like silhouette? Yeah, the silhouette of the person. So that's where it comes from, like the shadow project. Uh, so that's the that's the main history. Hopefully, I mean, it, it's so complicated in some ways, uh, but I thought that I would try to explain as best I could. But basically, you can consider this Christian Death Part 4 if you'd like, but it's just basically Roz Williams Part 3. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I didn't even have to take notes. Cool. Now we're going to get into the first album here for you guys. And by the way, I hate it when people do this. They named the first album Shadow Project. I don't like it. There's all these other words. <laughs> <laughs> it's just laziness. It's, it's, it's lazy. I just always think it's so ridiculous when our bands name their first album after themselves. Especially because you know it's probably not going to be the best work they ever create if it's their first album. Well, I mean, there are some... Well, I get it. It's not his first album, but still. Yeah, it's, it's not yeah. even close, yeah. but... I mean, it's, the album is really polished. You can tell that, you know, they've been making a lot of music for years. But. Yeah, definitely. Actually, this is this is interesting in that, you know, there were there was also a number of other side projects for Roz Williams. There's Premature Ejaculation and all this other stuff. So uh, keep in mind, I know all that exists. It's just if I dug into all that right now, I wouldn't get anywhere. So... We have this project where he gets it going inside of 1991, and it's a pretty interesting album. And it's an album that I, I had heard a few times, you know. And, I, and by the way, like back when we were on first met, I had been listening to these albums at the time, but I felt like it had been forever since I played them. Now, man, this album is really good. I really enjoyed it. It seems like they took a lot of influence from some other bands in some ways there's definitely a lot of themselves in this. Like if you listen to their other releases, you can tell there's a lot of their own type of styles in here. Yeah. But actually the one thing that the sound reminds me of, at least the mixing, it almost sounds like they heard Sam Haynes first album. That's another death rock band. Right. uh, Featuring a Glenn Danzig. It almost sounds to me like they heard that album and we're like, we want that sound. Like as far as the mixing and the, you know, at least the, the guitars and stuff for it a lot, it really reminded me of that. Huh. You know, I, I heard some similarities in the mix with Lying Deep to some Kiss stuff. Oh, really? Yeah. Is it the drums? Yeah, I have to listen to it all over again. No. Oh. Yeah. But uh, I just knew that like, oh, this is this is kind of what this sounds like to me. Just mm. the mix, not the instruments in particular. Oh, and by the way, for the, for the members for this actually, yeah, this album, and I think... For I don't know I think the drummer might get replaced. We'll have to see on the next <laughs> record. Uh, but we actually have the bassist Jill Emery, who went on, who's definitely most famous for being in the band Hole, the Courtney Love Group, for the first album. The I don't know what Hole's first album is, but it's uh, oh pretty pretty on the inside. I think that's the name of the record. But Jill Emery actually plays bass, and I was, I was like, is that the same Jill Emery? And oh. yes, it is. Um, we also have Thomas Morgan on drums. And then we have Paris Sedonis on keyboards. And Paris Sedonis had done a lot of different stuff with Eva and Roz before. So it's kind of like some familiar people in here. Also, Jill Emery, again, super heroines. So it's funny how there's all these 
Like I know she's most famous for Hole. Like there's no doubting that that's what she's most famous for. But sure, she's on all these really good like death rock albums too. Badass. I think she became a painter or something. But yeah, just getting in the album under your wing. It's great. Slow intro. It's creepy. You have Roz's distinct vocals. His style is all over it. It reminds me of like very early Christian Death and Super Heroines. It's good in a way if you're like coming off of Ashes, the last Christian Death record with Williams, because you have so much more of like a driving force back, and it really reminds me of like a yeah, it's really know, aggressive. Definitely. Yeah. This is not a slow, melodic acoustic album. <laughs> yeah that'll come later yeah <laughs> yeah i could i could definitely hear like glam punk influences mm-hmm. uh, not glam punk but glam glam comma, comma punk. punk yeah influences uh and and i think it's a good introduction for the album yeah uh the other flesh this is what you have uh, i've talked about this in other albums that Im- or involve raws where you have a lot of vocals that are like poetry yeah. or like basically just spoken word type vocals or, you know, it's just kind of sound effects. The other flesh is, is basically that you have keyboards. It's kind of eerie keyboards and basically him just saying poetry for a short period of time. Yep. And by the way, most of the songs on this album are actually really short and we'll see that change as the band goes on. Both of the songs clock in at around three minutes, some under, I think, I think one is over, but yeah, into the into the light is uh, seven minutes and fifty three seconds. Yeah, and that one sticks out as like, wait, all this other stuff is really long, really short, and then yeah. you have this one really long song. That was the only reason I wrote the time down. Honestly, it was because it was just so different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, death plays his role. I love this song. It's super energetic. It has these great shifts in tempo. The one thing that I I didn't know I wanted it so much was the duet vocals. Like with both of them singing, both Eva and Roz. Yeah. They work so well together. On like a lot of the courses, they'll do it where like a lot of the hooks, all of a sudden you'll hear, you know, Roz will be the one belting out. And then you hear Eva in the background just doing her "Ah," type vocals. (laughs) She has that like snarl and that growl. Yeah. That I really enjoy. I really like it when she, when you can feel the energy coming out, you know, coming from her. Like where, where you can tell there's, a lot of uh it's just a lot of emotion yeah coming off yeah and that's all over this album but especially with death plays his role it's one of the first songs on the album which i think you'll notice just how much like the drums and rhythm play a part in this i mean i really really liked the drums and like the guitar and bass all together like it just worked so well you i don't know if it necessarily says that the band was tight but you can almost feel them in the performances just going like yeah you know like really going for it yep penny in a bucket slowed down kind of drilled dread filled mm-hmm. pacing yeah darker feel to it i wrote sludgy tempo sludgy yeah <laughs> i also wrote halloweeny keyboards oh yeah yeah there's not necessarily solos. I mean, there are some guitar, what you could call a guitar solo on this record. There is some of that. Yeah. Um, guitar and that's really, really, and that, that particular song, I really like it. Yeah. yeah. It's like noodly, you know, it's not necessarily solos. It's kind of just more her playing up and highlighting a lot of the parts. It's just, she has some moments to shine. It's not, I didn't, I wrote, it's not necessarily a solo as much as it is like letting the guitar play for a second. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Epitaph, Time Will, this song, by the way, it's an amazing song. It's very has like a lot of what made Christian Death and Superhero so good. It has that very like LA kind of swagger to it. Um and just by the way, Eva's guitar. I just love her guitar on this record. Like yeah. sometimes I won't lie. Sometimes, especially with Eva O's new stuff, when she's playing, it's sometimes hard to remember why uh, like what made me listen to her music so much before. And that's just because it's it's kind of strayed from what I enjoy on most recent records, at least the most the ones that I've listened to in recent years, maybe she has a few songs that are different, but I haven't really sat down with a lot of her new stuff. Um, but a lot of it's so vocal oriented and kind of atmospheric. Yeah. The, when she just gets in there, it's playing good guitar riffs, like epitaph. That's it. I was, that is exactly what I want to hear from her. And it's great. By the way, the opening quote from this, you know, when it's like the whole opening quote says like the mask of the, whatever Mm -hmm. that's from, Moby Dick from 1956 with Gregory Peck. 
Wow. Just in case anybody was wondering what that quote is from. But yeah, I thought I thought it was great. One of my favorites was Red Handed. Really? Because really, I mean, uh, well, I thought the band played really well together, but the song itself, I just wasn't that into. Really? Well, I think it was there. I get what you're saying actually about it. I think it was their attempt to write sort of a poppier song. Sure. Like a catchy sort of song. I think I know what part you're talking about. It's like basically the the chorus. Yeah. It's, it sounds just a little off in some way. I like it because of that. But I think in my head, I'm hearing it as like what they were envisioning much more so than what it actually came out as, if that makes sense. Sure. That's fair. <laughs> uh, but you know, like the, just, I think what gets it for me is the great, just the band performance of the, you know, it's energetic, especially the verses are like really like in your face, the great bass. And man, I, I just, I like this album so much. Can you tell I like this album, right? I can tell, man. I can tell. Yeah, it's, I, you know, I, I think you like it a lot more than I do. Ooh. Uh, yeah. Well, I gotta ooh. say, I gotta say like my, my opinion, uh, shouldn't be listened to by anybody. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I agree with myself yeah, on that too, yeah. <laughs> uh, about this album or, or any album for that matter. But, um, why do we have a podcast? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Neither one of um, us. no, just, just because like there's, it's not a style of this particular style. It's not a style that I spend a whole lot of time listening to in mm. general. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, touch on it, uh, here and there, mm -hmm. but that's not to say I didn't enjoy it. Um, yeah. you know, there's a, there's a lot in here that I really did like, but there are also some things where, you know, maybe it's just because, uh, you know, I'm not steeped in it as long, mm -hmm. you know, as, as you have been. So. Yeah. But yeah, actually, um, I preferred here and there to red handed. That is so funny because here, here and there was one of the songs I really didn't like. Really? It's <laughs> <laughs> pretty good. It's funny. You know, it actually reminded me a little bit of Anarchy, Anarchy in the UK. Okay. I could see it. Yeah. And that's probably why I'd, I thought it was one of the more generic ones. Yeah. I don't know. They're just like the guitar is so close, but I think the song was pretty, like, pretty rocking. There's definitely some songs. Some of the riffs on some, some Shadow Project songs definitely sound extremely similar to uh, other punk songs or sure, other 80s sure. songs that I noticed. I, it's probably just Evo trying to take something and mix it up herself. I mean, I really like Red Handed a lot. It was, it was one of my favorites. Holy Holy might be my actual favorite from this record, which is saying a lot. Um, but yeah, I know that you're wrong about um, not liking this record. Um, <laughs> Working on Beyond, uh, I'm not really into that one either. I mean, the clockwork intro is like pretty cool and mm -hmm. it's dramatic and everything, but it just, I don't know, it just didn't really do it for me. Yeah, I mean, the that was one of those ones where it, basically for everything, every part that I didn't really like the way the vocals laid on it, I pretty much liked the way the guitar mixed with something in it or like the rhythm or especially the drums. Right. This is one of those cases where I like the instrumentation a lot more like with the keyboards and the guitars than I did pretty much anything else in the song, which isn't to say that I, I disliked it, but it was, yeah, that, it's that not was a my, bad song. That, that was it my just focus. wasn't really that, you know, yeah. Yeah. My, my focus was different. It suffers from that thing we talked about, uh, maybe the last, I don't know, a couple episodes ago, whatever, mm -hmm. where it's like when you've got a lot of really good stuff, like the stuff that's not really really good then kind of suffers for it yeah like clown is uh creatures or hidden faces yeah yeah where that's that's kind of it i mean a lot, there are a lot of the songs on here i really like but whenever it just kind of hit something that sounded sort of generic to me in in a riff or in vocals or you do have a lot of the songs that sound similar to one another and that's mostly because they're obviously making a stylistic choice in the music. Right. Um, so you're going to have some stuff that sounds similar, but a lot of the songs, it feels like they were worked on like very specifically, especially with the way that the, like the rhythm works together. It seems like they really rehearsed it for this. Maybe they didn't, but you know, you can have a good drummer that just can just do a whole bunch of fills and stuff and accents in the right places. But I felt like they were really into this music and there's some history behind that too which I'll get into in a second when we get on the second album. But yeah, one of the weird ones, well, there's a whole bunch of weird ones and I think about it. Sure. But holy hell, you know, that relates to one of our previous episodes. Our previous episodes? Our previous episodes. Oh, which one is that? The intro Psycho 3. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, uh, it says, God is, it was like, God is dead. Or like yeah, yeah. The, you know, it's like the beginning when they're in the chapel. 
Uh, that's that's the intro to Psycho Three. I thought, man, that's really weird. That uh, that's reference right there. But Lying Deep is probably the strangest addition to the album. Oh, I really like Lying Deep. You really? Yeah, I do. I I I love what they achieved with the intro and outro that's mm-hmm. just that sounded digging in the rain and everything yeah. because of the music there's a lot of tempo changes and dynamic changes and everything i think they did all those really well yeah, it was like a minute of digging before the song like even started <laughs> yeah but uh that didn't that didn't bother me mm-hmm. you know like i was uh, since i was you know listening to the whole album anyway mm-hmm. I, I was just kind of along for the ride and and yeah i was just yeah. like oh you know what this is kind of like a nice pause and yeah really sets the mood right it's like a really long establishing shot in a movie yeah where they did it really well you know like this is this is where you're at you're in a graveyard somebody's digging a grave right now and now we're gonna you know play some amazing music i agree i agree with all that yeah i also really like into the light oh with like the great piano and everything oh man the the other yeah, well <sighs> i actually really really like the guitar the piano, I think, would have been better if it was an actual piano, or like a different instrument or something. Like I think the I think the the you know the uh, the choices of notes worked really well, but mm-hmm. but I think that it was distracting to me a little bit because the the piano just sounded like kind of plunky, mm-hmm. and that was distracting. Yeah, I get it. I mean, we're gonna see some of that on some of the other releases too. Is it some of the synthesized things kind of clash with, at least in my opinion? Yeah. Um, I did think it was a really great song. It's a slower in a lot of places. And it's just a lot of stuff. It's it's kind of hard. I, I hate co- trying to compare it to their previous material, but it does remind me of a lot of their previous material in a good way. Uh, so I liked it as well. Good. Yeah, I was, I was like, is this another one we're going to have to fight about? Because every time we do that, man, it takes us like half an hour to like go outside and like beat the crap out of each other and then like come in and then bandage all our wounds up and stuff and and, and then, then and then hit record yeah and we're like and then we say oh yeah okay yeah all right yeah that's usually what happens every time you hear that that's that's what just happened oh yeah okay <laughs> that's that's all I, uh that's all i gotta say about uh the first album i think yeah. yeah i'm not sure exactly how much this sold of course early on the band was having issues just even getting started, you know, 1987 to the first album was released in 1991. Um, but on the next release, we're going to see some, uh, some different things happen in 1992. So you yeah. sound way apprehensive. I'm, I'm more apprehensive about the third album. I think, well, it's not, it's not about the actual album. Yeah. So you'll see. All right. All right. So that's a uh, shadow project, their debut from 1991. All right, welcome to recent interesting guy stuff. AKA Riggs. Sorry, it's just, you know, we've been doing it too sexy lately. I just thought I'd. Okay. Yeah. Hey, it's Riggs. It's Riggs, man. <laughs> um, got some interesting stuff. Got some good stuff here for you today. Donnie does. I have some, some stuff. Donnie's got good stuff. Well, we have an update on the Peter Murphy story that we talked about last episode because we do record these episodes, well, kind of randomly, actually, I think about it. Um, but I think there was an update posted like the day that we released it, released the episode Yeah, because we recorded them beforehand. But Peter Murphy did give a statement because in the last episode we did, you know, let everyone know that he did have a massive heart attack while he was, you know, part way through a residency. Um, and he released an official statement saying, following my recent episode in New York city with my heart attack and being admitted into Lenox Hill hospital and seeing myself go through the rigors of intensive care, I am very happy to say that I have made a full recovery thanks to the superb team of doctors, specialists, nurses, and care staff. I am so glad to say that I am up and running again. He talks about like thanking his uh, tour managers and assistant for saving his life. And it's great. And he's asking everybody to donate to uh, the American Heart Association to, um, to you know, get out, you know, just kind of get back a little bit. Yeah, but right on. that's great. That's absolutely fantastic, but yeah, I think that I think that was literally posted the day that that episode was released or something. So if this is where you get your news, you can you can relax now because you finally heard heard that that great news. Yeah, two weeks later. Yeah, in internet time, that's like a hundred thousand years. But people people do listen to these podcasts forever, which is so funny to me. That's true. I'm always like, man, people are still listening to that one episode. You know, like I just think of some episodes. I'm like, dang, 
stuff I said all the way back then. It's kind of funny how the sometimes these episodes are timeless in a way, but we report, you know, rigs is usually stuff that is random. Like could be, you know, it's usually up recent stuff, but I call it random. Anyway, another piece of news I want to talk about, actually relating to Bat House, is David J is getting ready to release a new album. Yeah. And we did hear the new single. It's interesting. Uh, I would say David J, his stuff is a little more artsy, a little more um, experimental yeah, than, some, than some of his other band members. Um, but the album is called Missive to an Angel from the Halls of Infamy and Allure. Now, I think that pretty much says everything I need to say about the song and the, <laughs> and the album. <laughs> uh, it will be released on October 18th of this year. And we did listen to the, the first track and it actually started, actually has um, uh, a collaboration with Asia Argento, which is really cool. It was neat, good interpretation. It's kind of like spoken word in a way, but pretty interesting song. Um, I'm kind of more interested to hear the whole album. And David J was obviously the bassist in Bauhaus, if I did not make that clear. Yeah. Yeah. In case you wonder what the link was. It's yeah, it's weird now that now that I'm doing this with you that like there's all these things. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. I don't yeah, know. Duh. Why would you even bring that up? I know, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I also mentioned it because he was touring with Peter Murphy right. the last year. Right. One other really quick thing I wanted to mention, this came up just as we were recording this. Brian. Yeah. Yeah, how we already talked about Peter Murphy and David J. Right. Yes. Lay it on me. Bauhaus is going to do a reunion show. What? Yeah, yeah I read I read the, the book right. about Bauhaus, David J's book, Right. Uh, Who Killed Mr. Moonlight, and I uh, I thought there was literally no way they would ever reunite after read, having read that book, but obviously Whoa. with Peter Murphy's health scare, that probably got him to be like, well... What if it was a planned health scare? I oh. what a horrible <laughs> horrible publicity stunt. <laughs> but yeah, Bauhaus, the actual band. And we're starting, talking Daniel Ash, David J, Kevin Haskins, and Peter Murphy. Yeah, original lineup. They have a, announced a Los Angeles show, and it's the first time in thirteen years. I think two, yeah, two thousand six. Yeah, know if it was Coachella yeah, was. Years. I don't know if Coachella was gonna was the last one, but that tour, that last tour they did, they're gonna they're gonna perform. I think that's the only show that we have right now is. They have November 3rd at the Hollywood Palladium. And uh, yeah, that's that's crazy. Huge news. Yeah. Huge news. Oh, you know, see. I would almost move back to California. No, I actually wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say yeah. <laughs> No, sorry, everybody who lives in California. If you love it there, great. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I, uh, I don't want to go back. I, I, it's too hot. Somebody was asking me if I was going to go, and I was like, I I don't want to go to one at the uh, Highwood Palladium. <laughs> yeah, there's there's other reasons for that. It's unrelated, but uh, yeah, uh, that's that's amazing. So buy tickets as soon as they become available. Yeah, they're not even available right now. They're not even available until Friday, I think. So yeah, that's like a few days away. But uh, it's just uh, it's throwing me off because they did a reunion album that was really terrible. Oh, go so away, talking about that. Go uh, away white, but I guess that was after they had done their last show. So huh. I don't I guess they didn't tour for that album. Go away white is terrible. I hate that album. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to I think it's like the second or third episode of of Gothcast where I talk about Go Away White. And I think Robbie Gore argued that like uh Burn from the Inside was worse than Go Away White. I was I still don't even know how anybody could make that argument. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's insane that's insane i never thought i would see it me neither it doesn't feel real yeah i'll i'll by the way i just hope they record it and make a dvd of it oh yeah i want them to so bad hire they a do, good editor well, hire good mic yeah. people hire yeah. good audio engineers hire good cable runners yeah well they did it for <laughs> um for gotham which was their their reunion in the 1990s yeah that's like one of the best dvds ever made for that kind of music i mean like it's a really great i mean you can't really beat Bauhaus Archive, the original stuff, but like that's still, you know, a lot of times when you buy the the reunion stuff, you're like, eh, you know, I wanted to see them more when they were yeah, not fat cats, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? You do tend to lose fire over time. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple shows where I went to where it was like really impressive. Uh, one of the people who, who absolutely had it years and years later, Bow Wow Wow. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, even, you know, like when she was recording a lot of that music, you know, she's like, you know, 14, 15, 16, and so on. Um, and and then I saw her uh, a few years ago, and man, like she had not lost it at all. She's yeah. super on fire. And that's that's a rarity. That's a absolute rarity. Well, Peter Murphy has a whole bunch of stuff where, like, he keeps, he keeps doing live albums yeah. of, like, of his stuff and Bow's stuff. So it's more likely. I just, you know, obviously the whole thing about his health. Yeah. We'll see what happens. But I just hope that they do a DVD just like they did with Gotham years ago or something where they release it to some digital storefront or something just so it exists. I just don't want it to be blurry cell phone video of like, oh, yeah, they reunited, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, Bauhaus reuniting. Awesome news. On to another David. David Lynch has announced a massive Twin Peaks box set. It's called From Z to A box set. Um, That's clever. That all right. <laughs> It's a deluxe 21 disc collection. Wow. It is every episode of the original TV series, the feature film Twin Peaks Firewalk With Me, Showtime's limited series Twilight Peaks The Return, also included over 20 hours of special features, including six hours of previously unreleased bonus content, as well as new interviews with Kyle McLaughlin and Cheryl Lee, a new featurette with a whole bunch of different people, um, and unedited versions of a number of the musical performances from the Roadhouse Bar as shown in Twin Peaks The Return. Wow. Um, it also will have alternate versions of several episodes, including the international version of the Twin Peaks pilot. Uh, it also offers 4K ultra high, you know, the HD versions of the original pilot and part eight of Twin Peaks The Return. Actual shot of it. I mean, that's the actual box set. Nice. It looks like a, you know, like a yeah. cube and it's like the, you know, the woods. But apparently the note on the actual, you know, physical release of it says, once opened, a depiction of the infamous red room is revealed with its brown and cream chevron floor and brilliant red curtains. Sitting in front of the red curtain will be an exclusive die cut acrylic figure of Laura Palmer kissing special agent Dale Cooper. Wow. So that's, I don't know how they can show. I mean, from the image we saw, it doesn't look like it, but I guess somewhere in there is that, you know, you don't need to worry about spending a ton of money on this set. I actually really want it. Of course, then you do. It's going to be available December 15th. They're going to make a cheaper version of it. It's going to be called the Twin Peaks, the television collection. Um, and of course it's going to have, you know, basically the show and then the return show. And it's going to have some of the special features. Uh, obviously not all of them, but that's pretty crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah, it won't, won't be as, as lush with special features, but uh, it's probably going to be a heck of a lot cheaper. Um, I didn't even want to know. Yeah. I, oh, speaking of lush. Oh. Oh, yeah. Uh, so some people like lush, uh, other people not so much, but um, mm-hmm. regardless, they're, uh, they're doing, you know, Halloween bath body stuff uh, every year. And this year they're doing the release on Friday the 13th this nice. month yeah nice so um when you listen to this you'll have a couple of days to like plan but they're gonna have all kinds of cool spooky stuff like uh, monster bath bombs and like glow in the dark ghost soaps and stuff like that um kind of kind of cool products and of course they're limited availability so you know buy them stock up make good gifts whatever um lush isn't paying me to say any of this by the way um but if they want to send us some cool cool swag if somebody from lush hears this if for, anybody yeah anywhere wants to send us that's free true. swag that's true yeah uh you have to figure out where we are first but uh but yeah which is the hard part honestly to, to some of the people who want to send me things <laughs> uh one day one day we may get a a, a, a pull box yeah a pull box yeah mm-hmm. uh but uh yeah so so some interesting interesting uh lush products coming out that look kind of cool there's like a like a, a bubble bar like you just run water over it, but it's like black cat with yellow eyes and stuff. Mm. Kind of, kind of cute stuff. Nice. I'm a, I'm a sucker for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Me too. It's just that little thing. Yeah. A little extra. Yeah. You know, in your bathtub, sometimes too, you have problems with with slippage. Oh wait. Uh, uh, on the on the floor and. Oh, so okay. You, All right. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. And so you know, you could either put some non-slip stuff on the floor you could wear mm-hmm. some shoes into the shower yeah and for those of you who are uh are really 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 into goth fashion mm-hmm. should know that crocs actually is now released goth crocs officially and you could wear those in the shower 
My God. I, don't, I didn't know how I was going to tie that in. I feel like Goth Crocs has come <laughs> in this podcast probably more than Peter Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> so I finally finally got Goth Crocs in there. Um, and that's yeah. In case you don't know what Goth Crocs are, I think we've talked about it a number of times, is they're black Crocs that have like spikes and stuff on them. We haven't talked about it? No, we have, yeah. No, no, no. I brought it up. I was like, are we going to talk about Goth Crocs? And you just say no. Oh, we, oh, we haven't talked about it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. no. I so, keep not wanting to talk about Goth Crocs. So... so uh, yeah, I guess I guess there was a big enough like response to somebody's custom goth Crocs and news articles and whatever that Crocs actually are like, hey, let's make some money, and uh, and they're pretty interesting looking. I don't know that I would ever wear them, um, but they're neat to look at. So uh, check check those out and practice good bathtub safety. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know, man. Oh man, I'm gonna look forward to it. Right on. And There's, then uh, yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say there's there was a show recently, uh, art show. Um, uh, if you're in the Pacific Northwest, there's an art show in Burien, uh, Washington, that was devoted to like punk, goth, and street artwork mm. um, that happened recently, and uh, in a gallery. I thought it was interesting that there's enough demand for it and enough culture for it that it's starting to become more and more mainstream Mm -hmm. and and in anything that people are into uh subculture and counterculture wise it's a blessing and a curse um but i thought that was interesting enough just to mention um that there is actually a a mainstream art gallery you know putting on this type of show so it's kind of cool happened september 6th which has already passed so sorry if you missed it one thing I thought I'd mention, something got released that I swear, I think I mentioned a hundred years ago, the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. Oh, yeah. The show. Yeah, I have to mention that. Yeah. So it got released on August 30th, and I did watch the first episode. It's pretty good. Yeah. I'm surprised. Like, yeah. I think they did a really great job, puppets, puppetry, and, and uh, you know, when they're moving quickly and stuff, there's a little bit of CG in it, but... Yeah, but, or when they do, like, the full shots sometimes when yeah. they're standing and stuff, you could tell they, like... It doctored it a little right. bit but works really well i mean they did a really good job with it i'm so surprised a lot of people like it actually better than the movie really a lot of people i've huh. I heard a lot of like people saying oh yeah i wasn't so in the movie the show does it yeah i haven't gotten through it all yet but i'm i'm going to definitely yeah and you have like it's just weird it almost it sucks that it's almost weird whenever you watch something with real puppets and real stuff like it almost looks weird to your eye now yeah because you're like because you know with most things that a majority of people have seen for puppetry or things like that or things you're familiar with like you've seen it saw it a million times before the new age of cg and stuff right so like labyrinth right that a lot of puppets are really goofy and stuff but i've seen them for so long that seems totally normal to me yeah like i'm desensitized to the fact that it's puppets and i'm just like oh yeah like that's a real thing but it you know you don't feel it the original dark crystal can be kind of rough sometimes yeah with it um you tell it's a lot more framing. They were really smart about the way they frame stuff. Right. I was like, man, I hate that I'm noticing this right now so hard that some of these are puppets. Because I mean, it's good and bad, but like it took me a second to adjust to it. Yeah. Where it, I was like, it kind I was, of pulls you out of immersion and then you got to figure out how to get back in. Yeah. And the more I watched it, especially because there's a lot more lore in this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like a lot more world building. Um, even though, I mean, really, in the first episode, it's different, but it's. I like what they did with it. And so does so everybody else. It's like universally like critically acclaimed right now. And it's uh, the prequel. It's a, like the context for the Dark Crystal movie. Yeah. You know, and, and backstory and stuff. And Exactly. You know. And there's some characters that look this... Well, you just watch yourself. Yeah. Um, Check it out. But yeah, really good. Eddie Izzard is in here. I want to say that. Yeah. Uh, and then Helen Bottom Carter. And uh, I think Mark Hamill's in here somewhere too. Really? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Let's see. Let's see somewhere in here. Oh, Simon Pegg is one of the... Right. Uh, God, where is him? I swear Mark Hamill is in here. Andy Samberg is in here? <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> uh, and yeah, oh yeah, Mark Hamill. Yeah. Yeah. So he is. I just wanted to... I did not know Andy Samberg was in this. I got I got one more thing. Can't, can't get back to Shadow Project yet. Yeah? I just... It's a very short PSA. The, the biggest favor you can do yourself and those around you is get better at self-care just saying just get better at self-care everybody uh everybody could be better at self-care and a lot of us um suffer from uh you know various um ailments and problems in our lives and whatever and uh just take care of yourselves that's all 
I agree, Brian. I agree. But yeah, that's a uh, that was random, interesting guy stuff, which is the name of that segment. Anyway, back to Shadow Project. All right, Brian. So we're gonna go one year into the future, or of 1991. All right, I'll wait. So 1992. Oh, great. That was quick. Yeah. So this is Dreams for the Dying, the follow-up to their debut record. It's kind of a strange thing. So this album was recorded during the L.A. riots. If you're not aware of that, it was a very intense time in L.A. Uh, And there was a curfew at the time. So the band would basically be locked in the studio after a certain point because you can't, you couldn't be on the streets. Right. It was a really, really crazy time. If you aren't familiar with what went on during the LA rise, I highly suggest you look it up. Yeah. And we're not going to get into that here, but we're saying that a lot of people believe that that really influenced the tone of the album. But yeah, this it was recorded during that time. Um, we also have a switch up in the band. We have a new drummer, Peter Tomlinson, a little bit of a rhythm changes. Also, I want to say is this was a time that was very interesting for Roz Williams and Christian Death and everything because you have the Christian Death featuring Roz Williams albums being starting to be released at this time. So this was released the same year as Iron Mask, as Christian Death featuring Roz Williams. And most of that album is essentially re-recorded Christian Death songs. Uh, <laughs> I forget where I read it. Keep in mind, a lot, especially with this stuff, I don't know if it's documented as well as I would prefer. Like, there's not like a, you know, just definitive book where you can read a lot of this stuff. Um, But I was trying to do some research on why they were being released concurrently and why Shadow Project and his version of Christian Death were going at the same time. And a lot of people believe it's because with Cleopatra Records, he could get advances to do Christian Death stuff and then could take that and then put it into his actual passion project. Especially with Iron Mask, I think a lot of people know I'm not the biggest fan of that record. Um, I think it it just wasn't as creative as some of the other stuff he's done. Sure. Um, and so a lot of people believe that he went on and, you know, kind of pushed the Shadow Project stuff more. And I think there's even, even somewhere I read where it said that when they were already doing the recording for Iron Mask, that they were using that money that the advance they got to make it to do some shadow project stuff or like to fund like a tour or something for them or to help them with that. As weird as it is to be having two Christian deaths release albums in the same years. Uh, you also had Roz Williams releasing both Christian death albums and shadow project release on the same year. Yeah. And for only one year difference too, between the last album and this album, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of differences, a lot of changes. Yeah. It's a lot darker, like a much, much darker, like, I think it's not necessarily a, um, it's just like a tone to it. I mean, it's, and also, plus you get a lot more of the experimental stuff put in here as well. Uh, so it's coming off the first one. If you heard the first one and heard this one, you'd be like, what the heck happened? Yeah. But tell me about it, Brian. Well, I mean, I think, I think overall the, the sound is more polished <laughs> and this might be the opposite of, of your opinion. I don't know, but I think it sounds like, I think that some of, some of the stuff in the last album is a little like, cliche yeah okay yeah all right, yeah. All right okay. okay and i'm not using that as like a, a negative descriptor i think like there's this archetype right you have you have the you know this is what this kind of music sounds like mm-hmm. and so if you're trying to like create that sound right then you're going to create it in this particular way and whatever mm-hmm. i think i think that it's i've i've used this word before in the past like i think this sounds less manufactured mm. than, the, okay. than the last album yeah, I think he said that at some point in yeah. uh, Clan of Zymox, Yeah, I believe. Yeah, Broken Winged Grace uh, at the end of the first track mm-hmm. uh, sounded like somebody's really ticked off their summoning spell didn't work. <laughs> well, and throughout that whole album, you know, I think there's a good use of metaphor and, mm-hmm. and mental imagery that's that's slightly different than well, I don't know, not even really slightly different. It's it's pretty different than the last album as far as the the lyrical content. It feels much more. I mean, that's not saying, you know, obviously formerly fronting a band, Christian Death. Yeah. It's not surprising that there's more religion, but this one really feels a lot more religious in a lot of the songs. And just in a lot of ways that the vocals are delivered, it feels much more like they're trying to do religious chants and different stuff. The content of it, and actually the the sound, it varies from atonal, ambient kind of stuff with some poetry to 
I mean, serious, this is getting into metal territory. Yeah. I mean, actual like, like metal, like heavy metal, um, which, I mean, there's guitars on the first record, but I wouldn't say really any of that I would consider necessarily metal. This starts getting into real, like much more of a groove, like right in the beginning, Static Jesus, which is like you said, it's like insane. And it's probably helped a lot by the fact that they have a drummer switch. So you get a complete rhythm shift. Yeah. Um, much more groove oriented kind of music. And it lends itself to that more metal, you know, in Days of Glory, like metal guitar. You have the duo vocals, but just the, just the sound of it, it's just so much heavier. Yeah, this is this is more my style than the last album. So when I was saying, you know, well, you know, it's not really my thing, blah blah blah. Like this is this is more what I'm used to. I actually enjoyed this album more than the previous album. Oh, okay, I did not. Yeah, I, I mean, I figured. Yeah, I mean, you could hear it when you were like listening to it. You're like, I'm gonna probably like the album more. Yeah, I mean, I I still think it's a really great album. Like all these albums are really good, but this one just didn't <laughs> compare because I'm comparing it to the other one, right? Sure. And it just, it didn't do it for me as much. I still think there's a lot of really great songs. Zaned People, that's one of the most well-known songs. Good spook factor on that one. Absolutely, good demonic voices. You know, again, more metallic. You have these uh, kind of like poetry, like poetic lyrics. You actually have a lot more of that, even in Funeral Rites, which is kind of just like, basically just poetry with layered vocals that are kind of out of sync. And that's sort of Roz Williams... I wouldn't say a signature, but that's something he did a lot, which was kind of doing the, and then I saw the light. And then you would hear like the echo and like a different track with saying the same thing, but it would be like a half step behind or. Yeah. I really like the vocal effects on that track on funeral rites. Mm -hmm. uh, the processing on the drums, the, the cacophony, yeah. you know, all that stuff works really well. And, and it's a longer song too. It's seven minutes and 14 seconds. There's a lot of songs on here that are over seven. Well, I don't, I don't know a lot. I mean, there are several songs on here that are, that are over seven minutes and, uh, and they're all pretty long. Yeah. It's, I think it's only like nine or 10 tracks total. Yeah. And, but it's the runtime is, I think that's like 12 minutes more than the previous record. And that, you know, less songs, but the songs are much longer, sometimes double the, you know, length of most of the tracks on the previous record. So you, even with less songs, you end up with more record. For me, it, it felt that way. I just like the the tone of the first one a little bit more. Like a lot of these ones up, like for Thy Kingdom, I put like, is it too long? You know, it's not saying that it's it's bad. It just, uh, it's just the first one. I just like the first one so much more. Sure, sure. I think uh, they're all amazing though, but. Are you familiar with Kevin Gilbert at all? Uh not not goth related but uh he did a couple different albums there's a lot of story driven elements in his songs and stuff mm -hmm. and, and there's some things that reminded me of Cal kevin gilbert as far as like song construction and stuff like that in yeah. here anyway if, if you're unfamiliar and you want to listen to some non-goth music go check out kevin kevin gilbert if you enjoy this album hmm. um but yeah we'll i'll play some for you later you know what one of my favorite songs was what night stalker yeah yeah no i i agree really strong drums great guitar nice use of dynamic changes volume and pacing yeah hey. I, I really dug it you know what's so weird is this song sounded really familiar did it in fact it sounded like i'd already talked about it before hmm. in another another um episode and it might have been the first christian death episode yeah. where i talked about super heroines and evo <laughs> songs because uh well, I totally talked about this song <laughs> because this is a super heroin song. Well, I guess we don't have to cover it then. Oh, okay. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> this is actually a great version of the song. It, it's obviously a, a lot heavier and like, I think it's better produced than the older versions of the song. Uh, obviously, super heroines had much more of like a punk dynamic to it. Um, but yeah, this song, I think dates back to like 85 or 87 or something like that. Or I think it was 87 because th the whole song is basically about Richard Ramirez, you know, Night Stalker, who was caught in 1985. Like, Eva O claims she was in a relationship with him. I don't know any... I did a little bit of looking into that one time, and it's... I Like, I don't know if it's actually true, or, like, I know that... It's, like, confirmed that she wrote letters to him, like, when he was already in jail and he'd already been caught. Huh. But, like, I don't know about it before that. So, but, yeah, the song's about Richard. If you listen to, like, 
it's actually like directly she says like oh richard like isn't she a good looking one or something or she be a good one or like picking the victims or something it's really really weird um but the song is amazing uh and um it's just funny like when when you listen like the first time i heard that album i was like wait a second that's i've heard this song before yeah um but yeah the the one thing i will say about that too is you know how whenever people re-record songs a lot of times it like is missing something and usually it's like, oh, the tone of the guitar or the tone of something is like way different. This, I don't know how Eva O does it. I swear to God, she must have just kept the same effects pedal and the same guitar for her entire career. Because no matter what performance of this song exists, like all the way up until like recent times, it sounds the exact same. Like in terms, it's like she just carried around the same instrument and the same amp and the same huh. guitar pedal because with the original recording, it sounds extremely similar to this version, which sounds extremely similar to the ones coming up on the next thing we're talking about, the live record. Right. Which then also sounds a lot like when she performs it now. So I don't know how she does it other than just holding on to the same equipment since the 80s. It's just a really old backing track that, oh, yeah. that, that she kept like in mint condition. Yeah, <laughs> that must have been it. I mean, it's just, it's crazy to me. But uh, yeah, obviously Night Stalker, I recommend that song because I've recommended it before. <laughs> so after Night Stalker, Holding You Close, I was actually kind of bummed that's the next song. Uh, I, that's the only one on the album where I'm just like, ah, oh, man, all right. There was two. There, that one and um, Circle and the Cross. I, I mean, I think with... Really? Yeah, I think with Holding You Close, it was much more like, what the heck? By the way, this is what I'm talking about, The with Holding You Close. Yeah it's much more like what Evo does now. Sure. Which is like mostly vocal voices and yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, I think one of the reasons I was okay with it is because it's not as much of a presence on this album yet. Yeah. Uh, and then (laughs) it's actually like decent piano. Yeah. So you have, you know, piano and strings Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, and I actually liked the the background for this. I didn't. Th- that's the reason why I didn't like holding you close. Is just because it's just poetry over moaning. There wasn't really a whole lot of musical ele- yeah. element to that. But um, circle on the cross. It did. Yeah. It it's better. Yeah. But it, it's kind of getting into that territory of right. some of that songwriting that it just doesn't appeal to me. Sure. Um, it's on the it's on the near side of of too far <laughs> for me. I don't know how to put it. You know. Yeah. Like, it's it's not it's not pushed too far for me yeah i I enjoyed it yeah uh lord of the flies slow intro biting guitar yeah i gotta say this about shadow project is they really did manage to put together like a full album like you take out one of songs it doesn't really feel like a complete work they it seems like they put a lot of thought in this and one of the reasons i'm saying that is because when i listen to christian deaths you know the, uh, the 90s albums for Roz williams with christian death i didn't feel that way uh, a lot. I didn't feel like a lot of the albums were as thought out, and I didn't feel like they were as well put together. It almost seems like, yeah, this is what they were focusing on. Yeah. Uh, and you know, the combination of them because it does have a lot of same people. You know, Eva O. Like on the on the Christian Death releases, there Eva O. and Roz are both working on the stuff, and right. I think even some of the other band members come into that. But this just felt so much more complete, and it's it is a really good album. It just didn't appeal to me in the same way. By the way, there's a little bonus track at the end, which has Roz speaking. And if you reverse it, it's some more poetry-like things. And you can understand it, but you have to kind of focus in on one spoken part or another spoken part because they're blended together and it's hard to follow. Yeah. Just thought I'd mention that. Yeah. It's like at the very end, it's like 23 seconds. It's not music, which is why I didn't, included as you know like uh, the song. only sign didn't like here or whatever it was just kind of like eh i mean that exists that's it's like on a the bonus thing. more yeah. than anything yeah uh so yeah i did enjoy this album i didn't enjoy it as much as the first record and that was almost largely just based on my taste sure um, yeah same here that, I mean, except reverse yeah except reverse right yeah. i enjoyed this more uh than the last album based on my taste so hmm. yeah hmm Sorry, I'm wrong. Oh, well, it's, I didn't say it, but yeah, well, I know I could see obvious, it on your face. You know? Yeah, so could everybody. I could hear it lingering in the in the unspoken words of the night. Well, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> until you opened your mouth and said them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it says dreams for the dying. Hey, Brian. Hey, Donnie. You know what I would like to hear? Um, a live album. Oh, yeah. I mean, that that's a... Not just any live album. Well, I, I bet it's a particular live album. I would like it to start Shadow Project. And it had been recorded in 1993. Ooh, and uh, released in 94. Yeah. Um, and have a title that doesn't make any sense. You're pretty, you're pretty lucky, I think. I mean, normally I would say those requirements are pretty... That's pretty strict specific, there's not gonna yeah. be anything you know that but in this particular case i've got i've got your answer i think i need to tune in no 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 it, it, it it's gonna be tuned out oh okay yeah but in tuned out but yeah this is shadow project's live album this album was recorded inside of 1993 in fullerton near where we used to live we have some lineup changes again on this release which is kind of weird um but you have mark barone on bass and then you have christian omar magical Izzo. i think that's how you say that on drums and what's unique about this live album in particular is you know live albums often have cover songs that's, yeah that's pretty common but this has songs that aren't on any shadow project album uh and that's pretty unique i mean like their original songs that as far as i know were only recorded for this release Actually, in between this is also some other things with that cover. The covers is there's a cover of Alice Cooper's Dead Babies, like with the medley of Killers. That was actually released as a limited edition cassette. Like they did an actual recording of that huh. um, before the you know this live album. Yeah. Of just Dead Babies Killer. That actually has like a just a promo cassette that was done in, I think in 1992. So technically that did exist by them, but in a very specific quantity and you know way to access it yeah anyway what do you think of in tuned out you know what i was a little apprehensive knowing uh going into it that i didn't really like a lot of the the following album mm -hmm. but this live album rocks yeah they really get into it for me it, it is kind of uh, i wouldn't say shocking but it's in some ways it's surprising because i do have a dvd that has um a performance from at the time, what was Roz Williams' Christian Death? And I won't lie, some of that is pretty sloppy. It's actually like a pro shot, you know, concert, which is pretty uncommon for most Roz stuff. Sure. Um, and it has, you know, Eva O. So it's a very similar kind of band dynamic. This was like, the performance in this is so much better than that was. Yeah. The energy is up there. A lot of the songs sound very similar. Like, you know, like I said, Eva Oak can always play Night Stalker. The yep. exact same. Yep. It sound, doesn't that sound like exactly the same? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, they. it's much more, even the songs that are maybe not quite as aggressive from, you know, like the second album, they're just bumped up with way more energy in this release. Oh yeah, absolutely. Everything seems really fast paced. The drums and guitar are just killing it throughout the entirety of the album. Yeah. That's why I'm kind of bummed that they only you ever used this drummer, as far as I know, for this performance. I don't know if he played on other projects, but obviously the next album doesn't have a lot of drums. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I just I just really like the way this was done. You have a lot of the songs that are you know, like I said, from the previous two albums, but the most interesting ones to most people are going to be obviously the Panic in Detroit cover, a David Bowie song from his album Aladdin Sane and because Roz is often compared to David Bowie it kind of it really works for me yeah yeah no I, I really liked this version of the song and you know a lot of my notes is just like great guitar great drums like over yeah. and over again you know mm -hmm. like like there's there's so much good in here they put it together really well so I don't have a whole lot to say mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't have a whole lot to say about yeah. this particular song other than just like I actually really appreciated the guitar playing in this yeah it it is one of those things where especially with the live album you're gonna have it where songs blend together because especially with this type of band yeah. where you have essentially the same equipment for every single song and you know the same type you know because when you're doing studio albums you can make it so that every song you know has a way different vocal effect you can make it so that every song has a, all these different guitars has you know you can have 12 strings on the one song and halfway through you can switch to yeah a mandolin and you can fine-tune all of your settings and everything like in between yeah. songs which you can't really do in a concert setting yeah and i feel like this album does suffer from some of that where it's 
a little bit of it blends together. Um, and that's mostly because of the type of music that Shadow Project played. Yeah. A lot of it's aggressive, fast, big chunky guitar riffs. Eva O throughout the show doesn't really change her guitar tone that much. And obviously with drums and everything, like it's all mic the same way. So that's probably the biggest complaint about this particular album. That's really my only complaint. Yeah. Like everything sounds really good, but when you're trying to listen to the whole thing in one go to, to write notes and do a show and whatever, like, it, you know, if, if, if I was driving and I was only listening to this while driving around town or whatever, uh, it wouldn't even come up. So the fact that I was listening to the whole thing all in one go, you know, yeah, it did, it did kind of start all sounding the same by, you know, the middle of the last second, to last song, um, mm-hmm. you know, when, when the heart breaks. But um, other than that, you know, like I, I have zero complaints about it. I really only have good things to say. Yeah. Well, the songs that are original to this are going to be, you know, I always thought lore, I thought lore was only on this album. I don't know if lore is on another album. I didn't see it on the other albums that we listened to, but the songs guilty stroke when the heart breaks. And I believe lore, uh, are only on this record, which is so weird for a live album. Yeah. I just, I, that always throws me off. They're still good. I mean, still in the same vein as pretty much a majority of their songs. Um, when the heart breaks is probably the one that, well, I don't know. They're both, they're all really good. I thought Laura was really great too. I really like, I think probably Laura is my favorite of the three, but, gotcha. but they're all really good. It's in the same similar style to their first and second release. And it's kind of a bummer. That they didn't do official versions of it, but I guess, but this is a really well recorded live album. I mean, especially, Christian Death has some pretty terribly recorded live <laughs> releases. I mean, absolutely. I, I some of them, like, and they are released on vinyl now. You know how they a lot of the Christian Death stuff has come out on released vinyl. Yeah, there's some where I'm like, they re-release that. Like, it's just terrible audio quality. This is actually, in some ways, pretty hi-fi for what they were doing. It is. Yeah. In fact, a few times while I was listening, you know, it's really easy for me to forget that I was listening to a live album. Yeah. Like that's how, that's how well it's recorded. Everything like some live albums have the problem of it being feeling like distant yep. to it. I mean, it literally feels like your face is right up against the amplifier. And I was like, dang, like they, they really knocked out of the park, which is kind of, I still think that's really funny when you compare it to a lot of the Christian death stuff that was going on there. A lot of stuff that still gets released by, you know, various record companies for for them is like the live i think like i think it's like dolls theater or something like that great performance just the audio quality is just really really rough and i'm pretty sure like that's been released a whole bunch of times i think sleepless nights and there's just not a lot of it i mean iconologia that's a great release but for every for every one of those there's some really bad recordings for um the performances it's one of the reasons why I typically shy away from live recordings. Um, but in in this case, I mean, it, it made no difference. Absolutely no difference. To oh, me. yeah. I forgot we also did one for Klein of Zymox, too. Yeah. Live. That live album called Live. Yeah. That was a good one. Dead Babies slash Killer. I just wanted to say, I think I still liked the original Alice Cooper version from 1971 more. Fair enough. Uh, I just, I just, I don't know. I just did. I like, I mean, I like early Alice Cooper. Some of his stuff, obviously now, like in most recent years, has become kind of generic. And of course, he had like the the 80s hair metal influence when he was doing that. But uh, a lot of his 70s stuff is like really cool and really unique for the time. So I really like that uh, that song. But it doesn't mean this is a bad song. I am just just want to make it clear. Sure. Yeah, I want to touch on Days of Glory. I really, really like the bass in Days of Glory. Nice. Well, that's something that's really weird about this. Like this album is because it's a different lineup than either album or any album. Like this is totally unique to it. Yeah. Um, so you have a different rhythm section. Yep. A lot of people like mention that, you know, without Jill Emery, the rhythm sounds different. Still really good. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Really into it. Same with lying deep. Mm-hmm. Like really, really liked that version, the live version of lying deep and the, the vocals on that, you know, again, the, the duet singing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really like in fact i think i like this version better than than the previous album Mm, okay i also want to point out that i've never actually seen this album in real life like a physical copy of it yeah so i don't know if it's more well shadow project itself isn't really that common 
Sure. I think I mentioned that a little bit on the, some of the other releases. But yeah. one thing I did also want to talk about, because we're doing the live album, uh, I thought I would group in a live DVD. Yeah. Um, what? the And then there was Death? Is, yes. Is that the name of it that yes. I'm looking at right now? That is it. <laughs> right there. <laughs> this is what you could basically think of as the, I would say the video counterpart to In Tuned Out, but a, a very different experience. Oh, massively different uh so this al- album this dvd was released out of 2005 and for me uh i'm gonna be honest it's a little bit of a miss uh unfortunately uh, it compiles different performances of the band throughout the years um and he has multiple songs from the band on here and it, it takes Imagine like three different performances of a band. You've probably seen this on like YouTube or something like that, where the audio is from one of the performances and they have cuts and fade-ins to other performances that the audio is not from. So it'd be like Ross singing and you're like, oh, okay, this is obviously from this performance. And there'd be like a fade of Eva playing guitar from some other performance entirely. Yeah, some weird overlay effects of a different concert and like they they cut to various band members where they're doing completely different things like from one second to the next yeah and um honestly i i hate to say i i unless you're a really big fan of shadow project it's not it's not a good introduction i'll put that way yeah might be worth listening to um you know as far as the music content is concerned but yeah but don't get it for video content i think just the presentation itself is the problem is if it had just been, okay, here's the DVD, here's the live performances. Like Sam Hain did that, right? Sam Hain has, um, I think, live at the Ritz Ballroom. That DVD I bought years ago, and it's pretty much just a straight VHS copy of a performance they had that isn't that high quality, but it lets you actually experience the show, pretty much. This, I don't feel is, it's very disjointed. I don't really feel like I'm watching the performance. Like, whatever they did with the editing, it's a little clumsy, and it doesn't really capture it for me. You call that editing, do you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm not an editor. I have edited videos, but I am by no means an editor, and I could absolutely put together a better DVD than yeah, that DVD. I, I would probably agree with that. I mean, it, it's basically for super fans. Yeah. I mean, if you want to watch, like, this, it, you know, it's just... And then there was Death was just for serious Shadow Project people because even the interviews, like the maybe an interview on there that's a short interview, even the how they put that together where the interview's in a little spot in the corner and there's all these like tiny, like tiny little video screens that are showing all stuff. It's very distracting for the actual interview. It's almost like you're watching like screen in screen like on a, you know, on a TV where you can watch the football yeah, game. Picture where you're picture, also, yeah, picture yeah, picture in picture, yeah. Uh, it's really weird. I don't know why they chose to do that. Yeah, and there's also some spoken word performance. Well, it's like a montage sort of of Eva's and Raz's spoken word performances with some then overlays also yeah. on there. And the presentation of the DVD, like the menu and stuff, it just feels very clumsy. And uh, that's not to say it's the worst DVD I've ever seen, but for what the material they had, I'm... You know, because they obviously had to have the source video files for the performances. Right. Which they could have edited in different ways and stuff. Remastered, put a little bit of work into making it sound. Yeah, it's just... A little less funny. And it's not that much... I know that it's not that much of a chore to make it that way. Like, if if they had the full performances, it's not actually that hard to make it like a DVD of that that represents it. It's... So to me, it's frustrating as an editor. I'm not coming at this from somebody who, like, from a perspective, but I don't know how, oh, I don't know how I would do it, but it should have been better. It's like, I know there are ways to make this better. Yeah. And uh, they were not done here. So that's really the most frustrating thing about this. Plus, for some reason, on modern computers, this thing crashes like every friggin' program ever. Uh, I don't know why, at least for me, I tried it on two different computers and like I watch, I watch a VLC and I think Windows Media Player just like crashes it. Wow. So I don't know how they did this. Of course, this DVD is 14 years old. I, I don't know what, what their process or what they used to stamp the discs or anything like that. 
So this is actually a professional disc. Looks like they actually had a, a house manufacture this. Yeah, there's no uh, there's no media line on that, and there's no coding for the blank. So yeah, I would say that this was actually replicated, which is a little surprising. Yeah, after having seen it. Right. Uh, but yeah, it it's just a really disappointing thing for me. Um, I remember actually getting this DVD and being like, that is that's it <laughs> yeah i mean and even just i also want to mention this the presentation of the actual case is also really bad uh it looks like a really bad photoshop job with it has Roz's face and then like a photoshopped eva o with a little like outline around her that's like a little glow and then on the back you just have the famous edward culver shot of Roz. all of this just I, <laughs> I, you can't see me moving my hand across just the whole back of the DVD. But this DVD, I just don't understand. By the way, I like how it's a 5.1 surround sound Yeah, for that audio. Yeah. Um, As if it's going to make a difference. Yeah. It's just really disappointing. And, and here's the thing. Like, we're not coming at this from a perspective of, oh, well, it's 2019. Of course, we have, like, we have better tools, right? Mm-hmm. And it's, like, really, e- it's a lot easier to edit and whatever. But back in 2005, I was also editing. Yeah. It was much easier to edit stuff like better than this. That's yeah. like that's what I'm saying. If we're older, we understand that 2005 technology, and like I understand editing tools we had back then. I still think this should have been better than this. I mean, Betacam existed, so you, you know we we've, we've done Betacam <sighs> edits. Right. We get- <laughs> we we did. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just so. Yeah, I just had to. I had to. I just wanted to share this as well, um, but that's that's basically the two live materials that you can get for a Shadow Project that are official. If you're gonna choose one or the other, in tuned out is the one to go Absolutely, with. yeah, hundred percent. Just so good. Ignore the video part of it. Uh, don't get. And then there was death. Unless you really, really want to see something with Shadow Project. And then if you need to figure out how to get it to play or whatever, maybe we can give you some hints. Yeah, we're gonna try to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's uh, their live releases. All right, so after the release of Dreams for the Dying and the live album In Tuned Out that was released in 1994, it was recorded in 93, the band basically just broke up. I mean, it was kind of, Roz has stated in his differences in each band members, you know, reasons why they said it broke up. It was said that... Eva O was kind of frustrated with Roz getting a lot of the credit for what was going on in Shadow Project, um, whereas she felt you know there was more being done by her since the band had started. And I feel like you can hear that a lot, um, at least for like you know her music separately from the band. Um, so after the release of In Tuned Out, three months later, the band broke up, and then Eva and Roz divorced. Eva then went on to release her own album or her first, I think it was her first solo album, uh, Demons Fall for Angel's Kiss in 1994, which is a very different album. Roz, unfortunately, I mean, he was already had his struggles with addiction, with alcohol and heroin. A lot of people say that it got much worse during this time period. There was other stuff being released. You have Dacus Kuroda. Uh, you have a lot, of, a lot of different projects he worked on. Um, he also did Dream Home Heartache with Jaton Damone in 1985. And then he also did his last album while he was still alive. I think it was. Like I said, he did a lot of releases. It's called The Horse's Mouth. It's called like Whore, like W-H-O-R-E-S-E, apostrophe S, Mouth in 1997. That was the last album he that was released while he was still alive. But in the last year of his life, actually there was a shadow project album that was recorded and so we have from the heart this is the last shadow project release at least you know that was directly worked on by Roz in this time period i think there was like another little like demo release or something that was done after it but this is like the last main album that we have from the band and it was released 20 days after Roz committed suicide in 1988 so he it was April 1st, 1998 is when Roz Williams unfortunately committed suicide. And 20 days later, the 21st of April, 1998, From the Heart was released. And 
this is a dramatic departure from the previous albums. Absolutely. It's all acoustic. It's just not really a rock metal death rock type thing at all. With some people, they might love it. They might hate it. And I think there's a lot of interesting stuff on here, but I have a feeling it will not be to everyone's taste. I really struggled with this one. After I wrote all my notes on it, I actually went back to look and see for the ones that I, I really liked versus the ones that you know I wasn't really into um, who wrote them. And literally every single one that I liked was written by Roz. Yeah. Well, you it's really strange. This release, it seems way divided. And the songs seem really obviously written by specific people. Um, first off, you do have Static Jesus, which is obviously from the second album, the last the album, the, you know, last, the previous studio album, um, Dreams for the Dying. It's basically just an acoustic version of that. So it has it a lot. It sounds like goth folk music. It is, yeah, it's weird. Yeah. yeah. I like it, though. I mean, great, uh, of course, as great guitar riffs, uh, you know, picks up near the end. It goes from soft. It has great keyboards. And the thing about this album is it isn't just like a straight acoustic album. It's It has like 12 string, nine, like, it has nylon guitar, like classical guitar, 12 string parts. It has synths and keyboards. And the one thing that gets me the like most on this is the drums are just like sequenced drums. Yeah. It's so obvious too. Um, and that's really what, like sometimes I'm just like, ah, this would just be so better if they just had some guy going, you know, just playing it with some brushes. Right. Yeah, I think the problem, the biggest problem I have with the album really is just it feels like everything, like they mellowed out a lot. There's just a heck of a lot less fire uh, from Eva O. You know, I, I don't feel it as hard. And, and and it's not really because the style is acoustic. I and mean, there's a lot of acoustic music where I'm like, wow, this is, you know, amazing. Mm-hmm. You can feel the emotion coming off. Yeah. It just didn't, it didn't feel as hard. Yeah. Well, I disagree a little bit in, in some songs. I think it it feels in some ways a little clumsy to me. I do want to say that there are some amazing songs. By the way, also Holy Hell from the first album is done here as well. It's a, it's a good version of it, uh, in my opinion. But mm. oh, you don't like you don't like that version of it. Here it is. No, flipping tables bad. It was so bad. You hated that one. I, it's so bad. I really don't like it, man. I think, uh, yeah, I think that uh, that they really missed the mark. Do you think you missed it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not as harsh on this as you are um, at all. I mean, I don't know. I think it's, I think, to me, it was an okay release, actually. Uh, there's some, stuff on here I like. Don't get me wrong. It's just, like, there's just so much, like, preachiness in here. Some of it, it's it's really... And also, it just seems like, like Eva's taking digs at Roz over and over again in a lot of it. it I don't know if it, that was directly what she's doing, but a lot of the lyrics seem that way. Um, I don't know. I think I've heard somewhere, please don't quote me on this, is <laughs> is that at this time, like Eva had converted to Christianity or something like that or yeah. become extremely religious. Right. I think you've listened to the song By God. Oh that gosh. That is like almost like a weird hymn song, like H H Y M N, not H, not His Infernal Majesty, the band. Right. Um, it's so strange. Like it, you have some really weird songs on here I, by god really stuck out it's not like i, I kind of like the energy but it was just so weird i don't know like you have a lot of clumsy stuff like even like alpha and omega it's just strange the weird arrangement percussion it kind of grew on me a little bit but it's just it like when you first hear it you're like this is what they're going with yeah tons of tons of bible references in alpha and omega tons of them yeah and then um yeah, like by God, like I literally was like f- transported back in time in my head. Like I'm like sitting in a pew at church. It was it was really really weird. It was. Yeah, I do think that the best. Like you do have some really good songs in here. My favorite. I'm pretty sure it was. It was my <laughs> my favorite was Hall of Mirrors. Million. Sorry, I gotta I gotta comment on this. Oh, yeah? Million years where she just repeats "I love Jesus Christ" over again, over and over again. Yeah, yeah. It's just like a bunch of stuff like that throughout the album, and I don't have a problem with religion, like as a concept or or religious people in general. 
Like, I think that there have been a lot of terrible things done in the name of religion, uh, all religions, you know, I'm not pointing Mm -hmm. any fingers. Uh, So it's not really like religious content. It's just like, it feels like a ton of proselytizing. Like, like how can I, how can I tell people about this new thing that I'm into? I don't know. Anyway, what were you going to say about the other thing? Well, it's still a million years. Like, that's one of the ones where I wrote, it's hard to believe it's Eva O. Yeah. Like from all, like, you know, keep in mind, especially this, since this is like the fourth episode talking about music related to her all the super heroine releases like contributions to christian death and then you have all the other shadow project releases then you have this it just seems extremely strange so yeah. then you're gonna talk about hall of Mir- hall of mirrors hall of mirrors uh <laughs> hall, hall, of hall of mirrors uh hall of mirrors i think that's my favorite song on the album yeah. that song i love that song i i really really like it i think um, it's either that for me or uh, Hounds Upon the Hair. Mm, okay. Yeah, I really, really like Hounds Upon the Hair also. It's a good performance. It absolutely is. Home is where uh, gets an honorable mention. I, th- I think Home is where is pretty well done. Good. Yeah. The one thing I thought was um, kind of weird, this, this is my complaint across the whole album, is that whenever it's mostly focused on guitars, it works really well. The moment they start adding like synths and those crappy program drums, yeah, I it just takes me out of the song because I can't not hear the song. But with Bitter Man, you have really strange things. You have some of like the talk singing again, or like you know just kind of saying poetry, right? Um, but it's this album is mostly acoustic, and then you have like industrial beats in that song, right? And it's a neat idea, but it just, it, it felt clumsy. And I want to say, I don't think I hated this album nearly as much as you did. Like even with Forever Came Today, I think it has great vocals. And I think some of the performances were good on this. I think that, I think obviously the lyrical content is just questionable. I think that's the biggest thing that most people have a problem with. Other than the fact that, like, if you don't like acoustic music, right? Then this, I mean, if you if you just don't like acoustic guitars, this is not the album for you because it's all over the place. Well, and that's, I mean, that's what I was saying about as far as like being able to tell who wrote what, right? So mm-hmm. forever came today, Roz wrote that, and I liked it. I mm-hmm. liked the the vocals. I liked the guitar. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hollow mirrors, good vocal effects on that, written by Roz. Like mm-hmm. that one. Then you've got several songs that are that are kind of preachy and weird and uh, not really into. Um, then you got Hounds Upon the Hair, also by Roz. Yeah. You know, uh, Melancholy Ballad, really good. And then, you know, another few uh, Eva songs. And then um, Home Is Where, another another Roz one. Yeah. So, like, just every time you've got Roz in there, you've got, like, good guitar and, and really solid, you know, lyrics or whatever. And then the other ones, is just, like, it's questionable. Bitter Man, to me, was difficult, not only for the reasons you gave, but also the, just the lyrical content. We're like, wake up, Bitter Man. You're so bitter. You're bitter touch. You're bitter world. Yeah. Like, I was just like... What are you? This sounds like I'm in poetry class in high school again. You know, so just, it's, it's it was yeah. It's I'm true. not into it at all. It does feel a lot like two different albums being written at the same time with the same instruments. Yeah. If that makes sense, it's you know all the guitars and like the performances and the actual instrumentation and stuff of the guitars is actually really good. The keyboards and stuff is uh, the drums are functional. Yeah. Um, and the reason I say it's, I think all the drums are f- like actual, you know, like programmed electronic drums is because the only credits on this album are obviously Eva and Roz. And then you have a uh, Michael Sir Serato. I think I'm not pronouncing that right. Uh, Sir, or maybe Servola. I don't know. On 12 string nylon and bass and, you know, and 12 string guitar, nylon guitar and bass. There's a guy named Nathan who did keyboards and programming and there's another guy named Brian Virtue who did keyboards and programming. So as far as I know, there's not even a drummer credited to this album. Right. Um, so it's a really strange one. I think they were at so different places in their life by the time they sat. I mean, because they worked so well together in the past, right? Uh, yeah. Um, and that's they, the thing, you know, it's it been five, you know, this album was released in 1998, so, and recorded in 1997. So, you know, f- four to five years of you know from 1993 to 1998 uh, 
that's a that's a really big gap. And of course, with Eva O going through a lot of different stuff, and of course, Roz. Yeah, I think uh, Roz yeah. was given up, and Eva was kind of desperate to save him. I'm, I, you know, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I've read a lot about him as you know in his personal life and everything. I think it's just so so hard to know where each person is coming from going in to record this. Sure. I just don't know. I think I think Roz went. I think Eva went to a place where she thought was brighter, and then Roz just went deeper into the hole. Yeah. Um. In some ways, but the whole album is more sad than spooky. Honestly, it is. Yeah. That's the uh, any of those elements that you like from the previous album. They're not really here. Uh, I mean, you do have like the lyric content, of course. If you like Roz and Eva, you have their songwriting. A lot of it is just so different, and yeah. It's it's not necessarily terrible. It's just, well, I mean, some songs are debatably, but <laughs> my, but, I mean, you know, my recommendation, right? Just just listen to the ones that Roz wrote. Sorry, Eva, I'm just not into it here. You know, it's hey, she's got a lot of albums we could look at, so yeah. I'm sure at some point, not everything's gonna be a hit with me, and and this is one where you know I'm just I'm just not into it. But you got plenty of other people who, you know, love you and listen to music. So yeah, who cares? But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> who cares what I think about okay, it? Okay, <laughs> yeah. In some ways, this album is a in, in from certain viewpoints is it's a little disappointing. In some ways, the first two records have such a nice, cool kind of just feeling about them. Even if you know, "Dreams for the Dying" is really dark in a different way and more metal, which some people may not appreciate. I think for me the first album is just solid. And for you, you know, obviously you like the second album better. It is really sad to see some of this, you know, like for like forever came today. I think that's one of their like most played songs on Spotify or something, uh, or like something from here, like, like is one of the most played songs on Spotify. And it is in some ways a really sad record. Uh, just if you think about what happened and when it was released, um, it's really sad. It was the first posthumous release. For Roz Williams, of course, we've had a number of different releases right. over the years of one track here, one track there, and different stuff. So, I mean, I'm so glad it was released. I'm so glad we got something. Yeah, but, like I said, I mean, I it it's still it's still worthwhile to to give at least some of these a listen, in my opinion. Right? I mean, if I had to do it all over again, I don't think I'll ever listen to the thing in its entirety again. But there's definitely tracks on here I'll come back to. I agree because some of the stuff is so weird. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, this was essentially where Shadow Project ended, obviously. I mean, you can't really, you know, I mean, you could have continued the project and Evo kind of went on to do her own thing. I think it's like the Evo o Halo experience is what is going on now. And of course, you had an outpouring of people nowadays who are so into. Roz, it's it's very interesting. Like I've talked about this before. I've talked about this a number of times, uh, even in my videos. It's that for Christian death, it's really weird that pretty much everyone's just like only theater pain, only theater pain, only theater pain, only theater pain, or maybe Catastrophe Ballet and Ashes and a lot of other records get left by the wayside. And so it's like why like why wasn't Shadow Project as popular? They did have like one official video. I think it was for Holy Hell. I think that's it. I'm not looking at it right now, but I think they only ever had one official video. Uh, and it's just really weird how the reason Valor Kane Christian Death was able to continue is because it was popular at the time. Like they did have success, but then as time went on, it, now it's shifted to be like, that's totally a betrayal of all stuff. And not saying there weren't people before who thought that, but right. it's really interesting now how pretty much everyone is just like, this is ridiculous that they continue. This is like that Valley Can's, you know, it's like he's when the Valley Can Christian death has been going like, you know, for decades. So it's really interesting to see the outpouring and love for the Roz Williams albums, especially on theater pain. And the shadow project does get left a little bit in the wayside of only theater pain, especially since that album now, like there's, you know, there's a band specifically called only theater pain that does only theater pain songs with Rick Agnew playing guitar, who is on the original record. So it's sad that these kind of get left behind. Uh, and there isn't as much fanfare for them. You know, you're probably not going to go to your local record store and find the re-releases on vinyl right. or something like that. And I do wish that there was more 
live video and a lot of different stuff to maybe kind of push people towards it. But like I said, there just wasn't that much of Roz Williams that was documented in a professional way. I mean, he the records were always on the cusp of being local hits for the most part. I mean, there was like some people who really enjoyed it and they were able to tour and do stuff like that, but they never had like the thing that was on the chart or the music video that played on MTV just a little bit enough to get them to the next thing or, right. you know, kind of like um, you have a lot of alternative bands like even like Sonic Cuter stuff or I maybe mean, that's a bad example because they did have like kind of bigger songs on MTV, but I don't know, like Dennis or Jr. or something. Sure. Which have like one song they did really well. And then they're just kind of like right at their whole career on the little steam they got from that. Like when they were in the mainstream to be able to just keep the audience. And it, obviously if you have somebody who is an addict and tensions within the band and different things, then, and you can't keep it together, that's going to be a huge part of it. I mean, there's obviously a huge gap in the music and many different projects, many different people coming in and out. And it's kind of a bummer that Shadow Project is left behind and some really good releases and if and there have been some re-releases of their music but nothing to the extent that you have with like christian deaths releases of like only theater pain's been released a lot of times on vinyl and you can probably find that somewhere so it's kind of a bummer that it gets a little bit overlooked for those just few albums that he did you know only theater pain catastrophe, catastrophe ballet and ashes and you know he did so much different stuff and this is I think especially the first two albums, I really think you should take the time to listen to them and uh, you know, see if you enjoy them. If you like, I think if, if you like Sam Hain, you like the first album. Yeah, I agree. I liked it. That's it, man. That's all I got to all I gotta add. Well, yeah, that's Shadow Project. And hey, I'm glad time, we took the time. It was really, seriously, that was a huge request. Like people have been asking me to do that for a long time. And uh, I'm glad we finally got around to covering these records and talking about some good music and stuff that people probably, probably a lot of people listening to this probably have not taken the time to sit down and listen to. Yeah. Go listen to Holy Holy. I love that song. Worth a listen. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's good Halloween music too. The first album is really great Halloween music. That's true, yeah. So, okay. That's, uh, that's it. You can listen to Gothcast on Spotify, iTunes, leave a review if you would prefer. Also, Gothcast is part of the Belfry Network. And uh, hope you enjoyed all of this you can also find everything at gothcast.com that's where you can find everything my videos podcasts uh yeah and just you know what you can do well i i, I you know I, what you can do i know where you're going with this you know what you can stay spooky I,